Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's session as we continue our look at the book Embracing Justice. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Topping. And I'm a solicitor in the firm of Brodie Jackson Cantor in Liverpool, where I deal with clients who have trouble accessing justice and who are in need of the legal aid system, which still exists, although in a much pared down form than when I started in the mid 1980s. I'm also a licensed lay minister at Christchurch Toxteth Park, so I have the privilege of leading services and preaching there on a regular basis. Tonight's session is entitled Building Communities of Justice, Legal Systems and Community Justice. We know, don't we, that the Bible is steeped in the language of justice and the people of God throughout the Old and New Testament are called to do justice as a central part of their vocation. Living in this diocese, you really don't have to travel very far until you're confronted by a requirement for justice. It's not stretching the truth to say that those of us who live in the city or who've lived here for any length of time have an acute sense of what is fair and what is just. My view is that this city has suffered more than many at the hands of the powerful and in so doing justice has become a core part of what we are about. Successive bishops of Liverpool have campaigned and fought for justice. David Shepherd's book Bias to the Poor was a seminal moment in the 1980s as we wrestled with the aftermath of the Liverpool 8 uprising and what that meant for justice. James Jones has previously been the Bishop of Liverpool and recently followed in those footsteps with his book Justice for Christ's Sake. So when we read that we're called to do justice as a central part of our calling, my suspicion is that we are tempted to respond, yeah, we know all about that. So what then do we learn from a book called Embracing Justice? As others will say and have said already, we need to do this with an open mind and a readiness to consider the lessons that we need to learn and the changes that we might need to make. I've already told you that tonight's session is called Building Communities of Justice, Legal Systems and Community Justice. That is one large subject to consider in the few minutes that we can spend together. And if you've read chapter three before you came this evening, you'll know that the topics discussed by Isabel Hamley in that chapter go way beyond the title. So justice and community. She says this, a common vision for justice or enough of a common vision is necessary to enable individuals to become a community. And she sets out her view that in order for there to be a sustainable community, there needs to be a common view of justice. I wonder whether this is actually borne out in the way in which communities work. For about 10 years, I worked as a solicitor on Scotland Road. I was kind of an outsider to that community, but sometimes I was aware of that strong sense of community which was bound together by some form of justice. On one particular occasion, my car was broken into whilst it was parked outside the office and the radio was stolen. An older member of the community on hearing that this had happened to me said, mm, leave it with me, I'll sort it out. Of course, the radio reappeared after a little less than an hour. There was a community life which are possibly a different way of ensuring justice than my legal training would have been familiar with. Does that amount to justice? Justice, Isabel Hamley says, is about relationship. And she writes that a common vision for justice or enough of a common vision is necessary for individuals to become a community rather than a collection of separate entities. It's actually quite a startling statement and it may be something that we want to discuss in our breakout groups in due course because I wonder what it means for those who live on the margins of society. Do they have anything to say about what justice looks like? How do the powerless in society participate in shaping justice? Are laws things that are done to us or things in which we are involved? In my experience, very often people I come across feel like justice is something which is dished out. It's not something that they participate in. Justice is done to them. Some of you will know that for a time in the north end of Liverpool, there was a community justice court where the judge had discretion to deal with things as the community would empower people to take action. So, for example, he would enable people to do more basic community service. 
and therefore he was putting back into the community a sense of justice and a sense that if somebody had done something wrong then their debt to society could be repaid by reparation rather than punishment. So I wonder what our experience of justice is and how that impacts upon the way in which we live in community, whether we actually have to be a community to have a sense of justice and how justice is shaped by the communities in which we belong. All of this begs the question, well, what are laws for? Isabel Hamley in her book poses that very question. She comments that laws do not create justice, they merely make it possible. Or, I'd want to say, sometimes they might make it impossible. In her reflection on the laws of the Old Testament, she notes that there are a number of laws that are undergirded by a motive, which she suggests doesn't happen in the West when we write down our laws. She quotes the famous example from the Old Testament, where the law is, you shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. So that law comes out of Israel's experience of being captive seems to me though that this bold assertion is actually something which we need to look at we need to carefully analyze what she's saying are the laws in our own nation devoid of motive perhaps we need to consider what the motives are behind the laws that are passed by parliament we might want to talk about the policing bill about the criminalization of what has been lawful protest or we might want to talk about the latest rules on those who seek asylum. What is the policing bill really about? Is it about gagging criticism or enabling the police to maintain order more easily? Are the changes in rules on asylum about using our resources as a nation or about political dogma which protects the rich at the expense of the poor? The author in the book cites Megan's law in the United States as an unusual example but actually she seems to ignore the context of Sarah's law and Claire's law here in the UK, which embody a story. They come out of an experience. They show how a society needs to respond to the wrong which it sees. I wonder how important this might be for us. The laws of the Old Testament seek to protect the poor, to curb the growth of wealth. These are the laws of a nation that have known what it was to be enslaved. That raises for us, serious question, doesn't it, in 21st century Britain? What do we see as the issues where we need the law to be changed? Are there issues in our nation where we'd want to see the law changed to reflect a particular issue? Some of you will be aware of the campaign for Hillsborough Law, a campaign to put into law a public office duty of candour. That request for the law, that campaign for the law, arises out of the experience of those who were involved in the Hillsborough inquests. The fact that a duty of candour was glaringly missing from the accounts put forward by the police for 27 years up to the conclusion of that second inquest. What are laws for? It's a big question and one which we do well to consider and we do well to consider the way in which government passes laws now and an attempt to politicise that agenda is something which we need to seriously consider as people of faith. But of course, we have to face a big question that Isabel Hamley poses in this chapter as to what happens when we lose faith in the justice system. And I think this is one of the hardest questions that she poses. James Jones in his book said this, the cry of the widow in the parable of Jesus, grant me justice still echoes around the memorial to the 97. This city has had to grapple with what happens when we lose faith in the justice system. Experience of Hillsborough victims is that the justice system is weighted heavily in favour of those who are powerful. It's a world where the powerful club together to protect themselves and their own vested interest. Hillsborough has been a background to almost my whole legal career and throughout my involvement with the victims of Hillsborough, those who I represent have battled against the powers that be in an attempt to get justice. I can talk for hours about this and indeed do so on occasions. But I leave you with this particular thought on Hillsborough. How is it possible that the jury at an inquest conclude that 96 people were unlawfully killed and yet no one is accountable? 
the justice system has failed the families of now the 97. And without accountability, there can be no justice. What does that mean for those who lose faith in the justice system? How do we have accountability? How do we make sure that there is justice? And Isabel Hamley in her book talks about a community centred on God and a part of the solution to the difficulties that we face is we have to go back to scripture and that's quite right. As we read the Old Testament we learn of the nation of Israel which in scripture is presented as a community centred on God. The relationship with God and his people is at the heart of how we read scripture. The handing down of the Ten Commandments and then the rules and the laws we read of in the Pentateuch prove that very point. But what about us? Here we are in what is sometimes described as post-Christian Britain. As we think about what our community looks like, we do well, I think, to reflect on the words from the introduction that Justin Welby wrote to this book. He says this, As in the shadows of Lent we dare to dream of the glorious light of the day of the resurrection, the day God pours himself out to right what is wrong, make whole what is broken and perfect what is flawed, May we start to think about how we are invited and to step into that work, God's work in the here and now, in making justice possible, in building communities of justice, in ensuring that those who feel that justice has passed them by are part of what looks like a fair society. I said at the beginning, I've spent a legal career looking after those who have no access to justice. There's never been a time like this. There's never been a time when the legal aid system has been so pared down that we are now in a position where it's almost impossible to access legal aid for welfare benefits advice, for debt, for consumer rights, for housing. But never has there been a time where it's been more needed. What does that say to us as people of faith about the way in which we build communities based on justice, where justice is available for everyone?